Welcome to Do This, Not That, to Avoid Falls. I'm Erin Jarris, an occupational therapist and Bay State Health Rehab Manager. I've worked at Bay State Rehab for 27 years, overseeing both acute care hospital and outpatient adult and pediatric neuro rehab services. I became neuro rehab certified in 2001, and 10 years ago, I co-founded the Bay State Health Falls Prevention Initiative. I'm excited to introduce your presenters today. Courtney Brown is a physical therapist at 360 Bernie Avenue in Springfield, Massachusetts. She has worked at Bay State for eight years in outpatient neuro rehab and pediatrics. She became a neurologic clinical specialist in 2022, certified by the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties and is certified in LSVT BIG a specialized exercise program for patients with Parkinson's disease. She's an active participant in fall prevention awareness in the community through the Bay State WOW bus and giving presentations at local senior centers. Michelle Lantain. Michelle Lantain is an occupational therapist at 360 Bernie Avenue in Springfield, Massachusetts. She's worked at Bay State for 19 years in outpatient neurorehabilitation in our Bernie Avenue location. She's an active participant in fall prevention awareness in the community through the Bay State Senior Class presentations, the Bay State WOW bus, and giving presentations at local senior centers. She also specializes in driving and runs the Bay State Driver Assessment Program. Diana Chung Edwards is a master's prepared nurse with over 20 years of nursing experience. She is a clinical leader and patient advocate with Bay State Health Systems. Her roles have included hospital patient care, adult and pediatric emergency trauma, teaching and learning, and organizational leadership. In her current role as trauma injury prevention nurse coordinator, she's dedicated to decreasing traumatic injuries and increasing community education. In her work in and around the communities, she's a Stop the Bleed instructor, and in Western Massachusetts alone, over 3,000 participants have been trained over the last several years. Diana has also been tasked with coordinating the Trauma Survivor Network Program at Bay State. Diana's work is also driven by Christian faith, and in some of her previous work, she's helped to facilitate community health drives with the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventist Churches. Presented at the Diversity and Inclusion Initiatives at Bay State Medical Center, worked as an adjunct clinical instructor, and serves on multiple committees. Diana is driven by a passion for serving people her work is always inclusive and it celebrates diversity. Diana believes in the work of healing people. She's a lifelong learner who will always promote health and reliable medicine that encourages and sustains the best quality of care. So thank you, Courtney, Michelle, and Diana for sharing your clinical expertise this afternoon. If anyone has any questions, please type them into the Q&A and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Erin, for that introduction. That was awesome. Um, I, I really appreciate everyone um, joining us today. So again, my name is Diana Chung Edwards, and I am happy to join you to talk about uh, fall prevention. So if you are watching this video, then chances are you are at risk for falling. So the question is, what is a fall? According to the World Organization, fall is defined as an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or, or floor or lower level. Now ask yourself, have I ever fallen? Yes or no?
How often do older adults fall? In 2021, 28% of adults age 65 and older fell in the United States. The results, this results in 36 million falls. 37% of these falls result in injury requiring medical attention. This equals 8 million fall injuries. Jeez, that's a lot. 28% of adults 65 years and older fell in Massachusetts alone in 2021. The number is less than the country's average, but it is still way too high. So I want to introduce Courtney, who is coming up next to talk about fall risk factors and consequences of falling. Thank you for your time. All right. Hello, everybody. So we're going to start talking about what can be a risk factor for falling down. So bear with me. There's quite a few here. Age. So anyone over the age of 65 is at a higher risk for falling down. One out of four adults who are over 65 are at risk for falling down. So that's a really huge number. Diabetes, that's one of those conditions that a lot of people have, especially as we get older. One of the reasons why this is so important to know about is because it can cause a condition called neuropathy. So neuropathy affects the nerves in your arms and legs, and it can start by causing numbness and tingling. So when that happens, you can have a hard time sensing where your feet are in space, and that can really increase your risk of falling down because you can't really balance very well when you can't feel your feet. What this can eventually lead to is something we call foot drop. So with foot drop, that means that the muscles that control lifting your toes up while you're walking aren't going to work anymore. So now when you go to kick your foot forward, you're not clearing your foot and you could trip on your toes. And again, that's gonna cause a huge increase in your risk of falling down. Race. What they found is that white people are actually the most likely to fall out of everyone. So there's been a lot of research done on demographics and um, they are the number one race to have the most amount of falls. Sex. Women are more likely to fall down than men are, but men are more likely to have a fatal fall. So what this means is they're more likely to have injuries that result in death than a woman is. So you want to remember, you know, as a woman, yes, you might fall down more, more often, but you're not necessarily having as severe of a fall. Socioeconomic status. What this means is your income, how much money do you make? And oftentimes as we age, we start to become on an income that is very restricted. Um, and so what they found through some research is that as you have a lower income or you make less money, you have a higher risk of falling down. And part of the reasons why this can happen is because your access to the things that you, that you need may be less. It may be more challenging to get to the doctors. It may be more challenging to have appropriate homes. Um, if you have a lot of stairs at home or you're living in an apartment that you have to go up two, two flights of stairs just to enter and exit, um, that's going to be a lot more difficult if you have any mobility problems. And the last thing is, if you don't have the money you need to purchase things like a walker, like a cane, that are going to help you to reduce your risk of falling down, um, that's going to be really impactful for you. Parkinson's disease. Um, with Parkinson's, it causes some issues with your walking. So that's the number one reason why this is <laughs> kind of a huge risk for your falling down. It causes a shuffling gait pattern. So what that means is you're really not lifting your feet up as much, and that can increase your risk of tripping. Depression. So the reason why depression causes some issues with falling is that you tend to not want to move as much. And this results in having decreased muscle strength in your legs. So then it makes it harder for you to move, get up from the couch, um, walk around. 
incontinence. So if you are rushing to the bathroom because you just can't hold it, um, that's going to increase your risk of, of tripping on something or bumping into something, and that can make you almost fall. Also, when we have incontinence, a lot of the times we're having issues with that during the nighttime. So you're in bed, you get up, now you're in a dark room, you're in a dark hallway, you're rushing to the bathroom again, you may not grab your walker or your cane, and, and that's going to increase your risk very, very likely of having a fall. Dementia. So what happens with dementia is people start to have problems with their processing. Um, so they start to make some rasher decisions instead of thinking more logically, and it can decrease their safety awareness. So you might start making decisions to do things that aren't super safe. So maybe you try to go up on that step stool when you shouldn't. Um, maybe you try to lay down in the bath because you really want a nice bubble bath, but then you can't get up. Um, so it'll just make you make some choices that aren't the best for you to be making. Muscle weakness. We touched upon this a little bit with depression. Um, if your legs are weak, it's going to make it harder for you to move. So if you aren't mobile and you're not moving and you're not trying to do exercises, um, that weakness is, again, going to make it harder for you to get up, to walk around, go up and down stairs. Visual problems. So our vision is one of the three main parts of our balance systems that help us to stay upright. If you are having issues with your vision, maybe just because you've gotten a little bit older and it tends to start going in the opposite direction of where we want it to, um, or you have glaucoma, or you have macular degeneration, which causes more of a tunnel vision, then you can't see the things around you in your environment. Then you add on, if it's a little bit darker, it's laid out, you know, in the winter here, it's 3.30, it's dark outside already. Um, that's going to make you at a higher risk for bumping into things and tripping. Cognitive problems goes along with the dementia a little bit, um, but you can have issues with your cognition without having dementia. So again, this can make you start to make some choices that are not super smart and can increase your risk of getting yourself hurt. Um, it also can make it challenging to process a lot of sensory information all at the same time. So if you're going out to the grocery store and there's just, there's bright lights and it's noisy and there's a lot of people around that, and things that you have to navigate around, that's going to cause you to maybe get a little flustered and, and again, do some things that you, you didn't fully think it through just because you're trying to get out of the situation. Decrease sensation. If you can't feel your feet, you don't know where they are. So with sensation, if you have any issues with sensation, it's really important to wear good shoes, which we're going to touch upon soon. Um, and also use your vision to compensate for the fact that you can't really feel your feet. Body mass index. So through a little bit of research, again, I'm going to keep mentioning that, um, they found that people who have a higher body mass index, so are on the obese side, um, they are at a 31% increase of falling. So that's a huge amount of an increase of falling, but it also has to do with the fact that maybe you're not moving around as much and you have some weakness as well. Being sedentary, we've talked about this. If we're sitting and we're not doing much, we're not using those muscles, they're going to get weaker. So taking at least five medications, the fancy word for this is polypharmacy. Um, the reason why this is really important is that, again, as we age, we tend to have a lot more conditions that cause us to need medication. And that means we have a lot of different side effects that could be happening to us especially if some of those side effects are going to make you feel drowsy and sleepy, that's going to make it so that your safety is not as good because you're not paying attention as well. Shoes, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, we want to make sure you're wearing shoes that are secured to your feet. So I know we all love our slippers and we love our flip-flops and our sandals, especially when they look cute but we can't wear them when we have issues with balance. If it's not secure to your feet and you lose your balance at all, you could roll your ankle, you could fall down, you know, you're going to end up injuring yourself because those shoes aren't secure. 
So what we recommend are sneakers. There's all sorts of them now. There's laces, Velcro, neither, you know, all those slip-ins now. The Skechers have some, and there's a whole bunch of different brands. Um, but those are really what you want to have when you're at home and outdoors. And walking speed. So walking speed is a really huge indicator. And there was actually a, an article out in the news recently about it, um, that it is a good indicator of just overall health. But walking speed, if you're walking slower, you're at an increased risk for falling down. So the magic number is one meter per um, second. So if you can walk that far in one second, so that's about three feet, then you're okay. But as soon as you start going underneath that, you're having yourself be at a much higher risk of falling down and getting injured. Consequences of falls. So there's a lot of things that can happen when you've had a fall. One of those is you have to go to the hospital. You know, maybe now you're having an ambulance ride over to the hospital. They're doing a bunch of tests, especially if you hit your head, to make sure that you're okay. Broken bones, two of the more frequent ones are your hips and your wrists. So a lot of times when we fall, if, you, if you're osteoporotic as well and your bones are a little bit more brittle, you're going to be at a higher risk of breaking something when you fall down. Head injuries. So if you hit your head when you fall, you really should go see the doctor, whether that's your primary care or going to the emergency room, because that could lead to a concussion. It could lead to a brain bleed. Um, and those are some really serious things. So you want to make sure you get medical attention if you have fallen and you've hit your head on anything. Decreased mobility. So now you've fallen. Let's say you did break a hip. You went to the hospital, you went to some rehab, you're home, but you're still not moving the same as you did before. Maybe before you didn't need a walker, but now you do. Um, maybe before you could go up and down the stairs freely, but now you're really only going up and down the stairs once a day, once to go up to bed, and then you, know, you come back down and that's it. Um, so it's going to change the things that you're doing at home and also, for the next one, stopping activities, it could change the things that you do in the community. So if you're active at your senior center, or you have a group of friends that you like to get together with and grab some coffee or go out for lunch, um, play cards, go to exercise classes, now you might have to stop some of those things because you aren't able to do them anymore. These all kind of can lead into each other again, so now you might need more help at home. So that could be a home health aide who helps with just things like some cleaning and cooking or grabbing your groceries. You might need a PCA or a personal care assistant. They're going to help you with things like getting washed up, getting dressed. And then oftentimes, a lot of this falls on family members. So now you might have family who usually are open to helping, um, but you're going to have extra people in the house to help you with things that you couldn't do previously. Increased fear of falling. So I know myself, I slipped on icy stairs three years ago, and I'm still cautious on my stairs. So, <laughs> so when you have fallen down one time, that's going to greatly increase your risk of, of falling again. And part of that is because you're afraid you're going to fall. So when you start feeling afraid of falling down, we can get too cautious. And then we start doing things too, way too slow, or we're really just, we're, we're too afraid to do anything, so maybe we stop ourselves from doing some things. Um, so fear is a really, really big piece of, of what happens when you've had a fall. And then the last thing here is talking about what happens when you've had a fall, and now you can't go home again. You know, you've, you've done all of the things that you need to to try to, but maybe you end up going to a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility. Maybe you're good enough, but you just need enough help that you end up going to an assisted living facility. And these are not decisions that get taken lightly. And we all understand in the rehab world and in people's families that, that this can be a huge issue and be very challenging for people. Um, so the goal is always to prevent this from happening. So where do people fall? I'll give you a hint, it's everywhere, 
Okay, everywhere, people fall all over the place. So we're gonna go through a few of those places. In the kitchen, outside, nice walk in the park. In the bathroom, in your bedroom, getting up from a chair, and on the stairs. So the interesting thing though is I think a lot of people think that you're more likely to fall when you're outside because you're on an uneven sidewalk or parking lot or you're in an area that you're not as used to being in. But people are actually more likely to fall when they're indoors. So when they're inside is the most likely time that they're gonna fall down and get hurt. The three areas in the home that they're most likely to fall are your bedroom, your bathroom, and the stairs. So these are three areas that you actually need to be really careful about and, and pay attention to what you're doing. I think that's, if I can kind of instill anything, it's pay attention to the activity that you're doing while you're doing it and use the appropriate assistance that you need to do it. So a lot of times when we leave the house, if we need to go outside, we're going to bring our walker or cane because we know it might be a little uneven and we want that little bit of extra support. But when we're inside, we tend to go, oh no, I don't need that. And we're reaching for walls and we're reaching for furniture and countertops. And that's the worst thing you, <laughs> you can actually do. Um, so definitely be aware that when you're in your home, you're more likely to fall there than anywhere else. So next, we're going to bring up Michelle Lantain so she can give you some really awesome tips on home safety. Thank you, Courtney. That was an awesome start to our presentation. So let's talk about what we can do in our homes to keep us safe. Um, I'm an occupational therapist, and my job is to assess our activities of daily living, the things that you do every day, and how to keep you safe and how to be as independent for as long as possible. All right, so this leads us to our fun pictures. Do this, not that. So should we walk around in the home in, in your socks or should we wear sneakers? Well, we've gone over this a couple times in this presentation already. We definitely should wear sneakers or shoes with treads on them. I know often people want to get cozy in your homes and you want to just put on your socks, even if they have the grippies on the bottom. I do recommend a, a solid surface shoe versus a sock, even with the grippers on the bottom. You need the stability in your foot. You need to have something that has good traction in it when you're walking around your home. And I know that that's a hard thing, especially even waking up in the middle of the night. You should have a shoe that you slip onto your feet or a slipper with a good tread on the bottom so you don't slip on your sh uh, in your home. All right, so again, no socks in the house. All right, this or that, standing while you're dressing or sitting down while you're getting dressed? Well, if you're having balance issues, you know that this might be something that's a difficult thing to do. To stand on one foot to put on your pants is a really hard thing to do, and it's not necessary. One of the best things you can do is have sit down on the edge of the bed, or even better, get a harder soft uh, surface, such as um, a chair with a back on it, so that you can get dressed safely. It allows you to lean back, you won't lose your balance on, on the mattress, or you won't lose your balance trying to balance on one foot. Sit down, get dressed, to have everything laid out, and it will allow you to be able to plan for your day a little bit better when you're getting dressed. All right, this or that. Let's go back to the bathroom conversation. So for seniors, over 80% of injuries for seniors that fall occur in the bathroom. Why is this? Because it has slippery surfaces, because there are lots of structures in there that could hurt you when you fall. So there's a lot of ways that we can modify our bathrooms to be safer. One of them first is to look at the rugs. Okay, so should we have a bathroom with rugs or without rugs? First, it's very important to look at where you're walking. Now, if you're walking into your bathroom frequently to go to the bathroom and there are all these rugs that you have to step around, that's really a fall risk. You can catch your toe on those rugs. You can catch any devices. They might roll over or lift up when you're walking. So it's really important to remove the rugs that are not necessary in your bathroom, especially around the toilet and in front of surfaces that um, go along that, that um, movement rotation where you're going frequently back and forth. Now, I understand having some mats in front of baths, uh, in front of your shower or the bathtub, but it should be a mat that has a grip 
on the bottom. You don't want those to be movable. But again, if they're in that line of, of motion, you don't want to have to frequently step around them. So it might be something that you put down before you take a shower or before you take a bath and then remove when it's done safely. Or you might need some assistance in doing that. So again, we don't really want rugs in the bathroom because they can move. There can be objects that you're tripping on. More bathroom tips for safety. Obviously, we want, we want to look at a bathroom with grab bars. There can be a variety of grab bars installed in the bathroom. You, may want, you might need a grab bar to get in and out of the shower. Sometimes you can have a vertical or a horizontal grab bar on the outside or the inside of the shower to help people step in and out of that tub. You can have grab bars installed next to your toilet seat so you, it's easier for you to stand up. Remember that our sinks our countertops, our toilet paper holders are not grab bars. Often I see people trying to rock and stand up by pulling up on those areas. I know your bathrooms are tight, but those are really not secured appropriately to withstand your weight and frequent pulling for your safety. You have to have them professionally installed or installed by somebody who knows that they're getting the grab bars into the studs. So you definitely might wanna look at getting grab bars installed in your bathroom to improve some of that safety. While we're talking about bathrooms, you might want to also have um, a nightlight put in your bathroom. We often go to bed in the middle at night and have to get up and go to the bathroom. Well, there are ways to put nightlights in your bathroom. You can have a plug-in nightlight. You could have on the bottom right corner here that we have an illuminated toilet light. Um, you can have lights put in at the baseboards of, in your bed, of the rooms that you're in. You want to make sure that you're well lit. Often getting up and turning on the light in the bathroom, if that's your only option, that's a good option, but it also might make you lose some of your vision and your balance if you do that when you're not fully awake. So you want to have soft illuminated light. I have some people who often will use a flashlight or um, a, a little um, LED light hooked to their um, assistive devices, such as their walker or cane, to help just illuminate the ground when you're walking into those bathrooms. So it's not such a bright light, you don't lose your balance, but you still have the lighting. The lighting is so important, and I'm not just even talking about your bathroom, also in your bedroom. If you have to get up in the middle of the night, if you have equipment, or if you have a tight bedroom where there's things cluttered on the floor, you need to make sure that you're able to see where you're walking. You might need to also see to put on your shoes or your slippers so that you don't slip when you're doing those things. So again, we want to have lighting. It's the most, one of the most important things that we have in our bedrooms, in our bathrooms, in our hallways, places that you frequent when you're walking at night. There are so many wonderful options that are even like automatic lights or sensory, sensor, sensory lights that when someone walks by, it will light up a little bit or it's dim when the people aren't walking by frequently. There's a lot of things out there that they didn't used to have. So another main area that people fall are on the stairs. Stairs are super important to have well lit. We should have, if possible, light switches at the bottom and the top of the stairs so that we are illuminating the, the, those surfaces. You can make sure that there's not animals or objects on there, nothing that's gonna make you slip and fall down because falling on the stairs, you're very likely to hit your head, break a bone, it could be a very turbulent and a very bad injury that you have. So we don't wanna put things on our stairs. I often, when I'm cleaning up my house at night, will put the shoes that need to go upstairs on the stairs. That's really not the best place to put them because someone may not notice that. Often we're moving around our homes and we don't expect those, th those objects to be there and someone might trip and fall down them. So again, we wanna make sure that your stairs are well lit and without clutter. This or that. Let's look at our kitchens. One of the things I try to stress with people about the kitchens is that really reorganizing your kitchen is the best way to prevent falls in your kitchen. We can make little stations of the items that we use frequently that are stored close to the areas that we need, such as having your pots and pans right next to the stove, having your plates so that they're easy for you to plate right next to the stove if that's where you cook, having your refrigerator next to a cabinet that has your glasses if you're somebody who likes to have a lot of beverages during the day. So you want to arrange your, your home so you have less amount of things that you have to carry across your kitchen. This really prevents you from having to cumbersomely carry a heavy pan across the room or fill up something with water. These things will allow you to move smoother throughout your kitchen. 
I often tell people, if you have a hard time with your balance, you might want to look at getting one of those um, heat preventer, like um, hot plate um, surfaces that you're able to put a hot pan on so that you don't have to carry it and maybe you can drag it on the countertop. You can also fill water and drag it over to the stove. Those things will help you from having to carry those items across the room. Also, you want to make sure that you don't have any area rugs in that kitchen. Often people put rugs in front of your sink, and I know that that's an area where there could be falls because of water, but having an area rug is also a hazard because you might trip on that as you're moving throughout your kitchen while you're cooking or retrieving items. So make sure that you try to organize your kitchen as neatly and as organized by station as possible. That way you can move throughout your kitchen easier and not have to carry things. All right, so we've talked a lot about the bedroom, having lighting. We've talked about the kitchen, organizing. We've talked about making sure that there's lights on the stairs, hallways, bathrooms. We've talked about grab bars and safety, uh, safety equipment in the bathrooms. Um, what do we do if we do fall? Now, there's lots of options for safety in your home. Obviously, not having an emergency button is not, a, is not a great option. So we want to have some kind of emergency button. That doesn't mean that you need to have Lifeline or any of those, but that is an option. Um, I often tell people if you're at, at risk for falling or even when you're moving around your home, having a smartwatch or a phone with you at all times is really smart. Also, some people, if you don't have that option, you can get um, some Amazon devices or iDevices that you can program to contact emergency services if you yell for them. So that is another option if you're conscious enough, if you do fall, to be able to say, call my daughter, call my son, call the fire department, call 911. You can program these devices that will work with your systems that you have in your home so that you're able to ask for help if you need it. And that is a wonderful advancement in technology that keeps a lot of people very, very safe. Did I give you too much information? <laughs> so there's a lot of things that you want to do this, not that. I think the biggest thing to do is to plan your day a little bit, slow down, and try to organize yourself throughout your home. Of course, reducing clutter, throw rugs, things of that sort will help remove those areas that you might not think about as you're moving through your home quickly. All right, so I'm going to turn us back over to Courtney, and she's going to talk to you about what to do if we do fall, and we need some help. Did you miss me? <laughs> All right, so what's the next step, okay? When we've had a fall or we're afraid of falling or we're at risk of falling, what do we need to do? Like Erin said, she helped develop this program, the Falls Prevention Initiative, so FPI. And we've had it here at Bay State for 10 years. And our goal is to try and introduce information to people in the community who are at risk of falling to reduce that risk and to help keep you guys safe. So what is the Falls Prevention Initiative? It's a program that we have here at Bay State Rehab Care, and we treat people who are at risk for falling or who have actually fallen already. So there is a little bit of criteria for our uh, falls prevention initiative that we often will ask you, are you afraid of falling? Do you feel unsteady with activities like standing up, sitting down, walking, or getting up from a chair? Um, we also wanna know, have you had a fall in the last year? You know, if you have, then you really need to be coming to see us for some physical therapy. So. Let's talk a little bit more about what the FPI is. So this program is looking at your fall risk. We need to do an initial evaluation. So that's when you come in and see us the first day. What we're going to look at is how are you walking? How's your balance? Can you stand on one foot? Can you vary your base of support? Meaning, can you put your feet close together? Can you close your eyes and hold your balance? Um, what's your strength in your legs? Do you have some muscle weakness? And we're going to take all of that information on that first day and make a plan for you so that we can work on the things that you need specifically to help reduce your risk of falling. 
One of the things that we're really huge on is homework. So we want to make sure that at the end of the four weeks that you're with us, you have a good home exercise program that you can continue to do as a maintenance program once you're finished with us in therapy. So we have three sets of exercises, and it can be used for all different levels, which is part of why this program is really great. Um, And we want to make sure that you feel comfortable and confident continuing with those exercises when you're done with us. So the frequency is two times a week for four weeks. So it's an eight-visit program in total. And our goal is over those eight visits to make you feel more confident and to feel stronger and feel um, have a little bit decreased fear of falling down, especially if you've had a fall in the past. So I'm just going to go to locations next because I want to have this up for you um, so that you can see if there's a spot and area that you could come and see us. The great thing about this program is it's not that hard to get into. (laughs) You just need to contact your doctor, so whoever your primary care physician is, and you can go see them and tell them, hey, I fell a month ago, and I just went on this Bay State webinar, and they told me they have a program program to get me stronger. Um, So you can just make an appointment with your doctor and ask them to send you to see us. So what you have to ask for is a physical therapy order. And when they write that down, they'll write it's for fall prevention or fear of falling. Um, If they put that information on that order, then you can give us a call and we can make an appointment. Okay. So we have all sorts of locations here. The great thing, too, is this is a regionalized program. So wherever you are watching us from today, hopefully one of these spots is close enough to you that you feel comfortable that you could make it there for a two-time a week for a four-week program. And I'm just going to tell you our phone number, even though it's still on their screen. Um, If you need to make an appointment, once you've got that order from your doctor, you call 413 794-1600, and it's option two that you can make an appointment, okay? So thank you all for coming to see us today. Um, We really appreciate your time. We know everybody's busy, so we really appreciate you coming to see us, Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon. So stay safe. It looks like we don't have any questions. Um, I'm just going to say that if you do have a question really quickly, there is a Q&A option on your screen, okay? So if you have a question, I'll kind of chat very slowly here for a moment. If you have a question, you can type it in there. If not, um, you can always go to the Bay State Health website, and there is information on how to see us at rehab, okay? All right. Thank you all for coming. Stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you soon for some exercise together.